Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Father Dale Tuckerman from the Diocese of Spokane, Washington. Father Dale Tuckerman is one of the members of the Priestly Fraternity of St. Joseph, of which I am also a member. And uh, we also have uh, with us tonight Father Christopher Burnaby, another priest with the Priestly Fraternity of St. Joseph. He'll be preaching and celebrating the Mass for the Holy League tomorrow evening. So we get to hear from both of these priests. So, Father Tuckerman will be speaking on the three ages of the interior life versus modern anthropology. Thank you, Father Anderson. It's, a, it's always a pleasure to come here and spend time at St. Stephen Parish. And I'm especially thankful for uh, the connections that our Lord has given to us through St. Joseph, the priestly fraternity that we have. And it's even been a great help pastorally in my own parishes as we had some of the families from one of my parish. One of my parishes where we have the traditional Latin Mass was able to come down and receive uh, Holy Confirmation uh, at the uh, graciousness of our church of sample last year. So always thankful to be here, uh, not only for my own self, but even the graces that overflow uh, from this place, even for us in the Diocese of Spokane, at least in that case. Before we begin, I, we did pray that beautiful prayer honoring our Lord's incarnation, and of course, Our Lady. But why don't we pray just really quickly to Our Lady, Seed of Wisdom, especially asking her that we might have true wisdom, who of course is the fruit of her womb, our Lord Jesus Christ, as he says that he is the truth, capital T. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Mother of mercy, grant us the favor of obtaining the true wisdom of God, and so make us those whom you love, teach, and guide, whom you nourish and protect as your children and slaves. Virgin most faithful, make us in everything so committed, disciples, imitators, and slaves of Jesus, your Son, who is incarnate wisdom, that we may become, through your intercession and example, fully mature, with the fullness which Jesus possessed on earth and with the fullness of his glory in heaven. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So when I told Father that I was going to come down, he asked me to do this talk, and I'm pretty sure that I flatly told him no. And then he said, oh, come on, now you must have given a talk sometime in the last uh, little bit. Maybe I didn't. He's making a face, so I probably didn't. I just felt like saying no. And I said, well, I did just give a, a talk. And I do want to say uh, that this talk mostly was uh, designed in order to try and get people to read this amazing book. This book is called The Three Ages of the Interior Life by Father Gary Gou Lagrange. Father Gary Gou Lagrange was a Dominican priest uh, a renowned theologian in the 20th century. There's a biography of him that calls him the monster of Thomism. And that is because he was a formidable uh, voice in the theological forums throughout the world and the church, especially uh, standing up for the truths that the church has taught, those dogmas of the church, and especially fighting against the errors that really were coming and becoming very popular in the church, especially in theological circles, in seminaries, in, in the thought of priests, in books that were being written, that were really following along the lines of those condemnations of Pope, blessed Pope, Pius IX, and of course the, the famous uh, encyclical Pascendi by Pope Saint Pius X, 
uh, this modernism that was coming in, and we had uh, a wonderful talk, which for some reason Google has decided I need to watch like 10 times, because every time that I go on to YouTube, that wonderful talk by our other confrere, Father Joseph Brigida, on modernism comes up on my YouTube feed. It's like the most popular uh, YouTube video ever. Uh, if you watch the videos that I watch, apparently. So hopefully this video will not be as popular because I don't think it's as good as Father Brigida's for sure, but this book is amazing. And so Father Gregor Lagrange is a, uh, a great, not only voice during that time against modernism, but that was not his focus in his specialty. His specialty was really ascetical theology, what we might call spiritual theology today. And he was kind of a legend. In fact, he was so popular that people would flock to his lectures. Father Burnaby and I were both blessed to go and our alumni of the university where he taught in Rome, the Angelicum, the, uh, which is named after St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor. And they have a room there, which is called the Great Room, in Italian, and it was built because Father Gary Lagrange taught there, and the rooms there were not big enough to hold all the people that would come on a regular basis to his lectures. They built this huge room in the middle, and he was so renowned and so wise and learned that St. John Paul II sought him out when he was studying in Rome in order to be his doctoral dissertation advisor. So when St. John Paul II wrote his doctoral thesis on St. John of the Cross, he didn't seek out a Carmelite, which would seem to be the person to seek out to know St. John of the Cross, but rather Father Gary Goulagrange, who was such a master of the spiritual life and the science of understanding the interior life of the Christian, that he, he made this great synthesis of the dogmatic theology of St. Thomas Aquinas, the specialty, of course, of the Dominicans, which St. Thomas was, and St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, as well as the other doctors of the church. This book, which this is just the first volume of it, there actually is another volume, is a synthesis in which he put together a lot of what he taught in order to make it accessible, not just to those who are studying in Rome, but to all people. And I can't recommend it enough as something that is going to be extremely helpful for taking all of the teachings of the church on growth in holiness that come from uh, the dogmas of the church, from the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas, the teachings of the great saints, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, and making it very accessible. My one recommendation is, is when you buy this book, because you're all going to run out and buy this book immediately after, if you're not currently perusing on your phone right now and buying it from somewhere other than the evil company Amazon, and uh, <clears throat> that uh, as you're doing this, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say, skip the introduction. Skip the <laughs> introduction, which is kind of like a scholarly treatise on uh, what is aesthetical theology. You don't, you don't really need to know that if you have curiosity. After you read it and you realize, wow, now I know what I need to do. I understand my predominant fault and what I need to go against and how to mortify uh, my lower senses so the concupiscence is not preventing me from moving forward in, in grace and charity, then you can go back out of curiosity and read the introduction. But just skip that so that you can get right into really the good stuff. And he always begins by going uh, and starting with the sources of truth, especially in the Holy Scriptures, and then on to the doctors of the church. Okay, having said that, uh, I am now going to do what he does. At one point, he, he speaks about different errors in understanding what is human perfection about. So Father spoke about in his homily today, this idea of perfection is completeness. 
And that's true. What we want is, is to have no completeness. There's a certain completeness about coming to the end of our life. Our life is then over. The things that have happened before cannot be changed. But there's also another sense of perfection, of course, in not having deficiencies and overcoming deficiencies and having a certain fullness to what the nature of the thing that we're speaking of, if it's human nature, then being fully human, right? would be the perfection of humanity. And so we know as Catholics that the perfection of the human person lies beyond our human nature. But it is found in Christ Jesus and the fullness of charity, which transcends human nature itself. However, we live in a time that, of course, denies that. And Father Gergel Lagrange, as speaking to us about Christian perfection, actually proposes looking at, well, there are several different virtues, there are several different ways of looking at the activity of the human person that leads to perfection throughout time. We know that it's the perfection of charity because that's taught by our faith, but throughout time, there have been others. And so, he first begins by pointing out that many of the pagan philosophers, and many uh, of them uh, before that as well, and, and throughout time, we've seen one idea, which is that the perfection of the human person is in fortitude. Now, bear with me here, because I'm going to relate this to the things of today, or I'm going to attempt to, and we're going to see how it goes. So one idea is that the perfection of the human person, that to be fully human, and fully, to be fully fulfilled, we could say, is to have fortitude, to do things that are hard. And we actually see this, of course, in some of the uh, Platonic dialogues. Uh, this idea of like, well, it is to be courageous and to live life well, right? We might say today, to give your barbaric yawp to the world, right? Or, or to make a choice to follow that which makes you passionate and to, and to follow it through. Right? Or we might say that the object of life in order to really be happy and fulfilled in life, you just kind of have to go forward and be you. And you have to be really courageous about saying, you know what? I might be married to Kanye West, but it's me time, and I'm going to take this time for me, right? Like Kim Kardashian is doing right now. I'm pretty sure she spent the rest of her life on me time, but now she's really going to do it, and she's going to be courageous about it, you know? And so we get that too, you know? All the advertisements want to say, like, you need to take you time. Be courageous and make it for you. And there's something about that. There's something right about that. There, there needs to be a certain amount of courage to be authentic. And so some people have said throughout time, maybe that courage is to overcome great obstacles. You know, to, to fight to the top. And uh, I saw a very inspiring speech the other day. Uh, and she was saying, you know, she fought so hard and so many people have fought for her so that she could be the first woman president of the United States and she was crying. It was beautiful. I was like, wow, it's president. She's fought so hard. Anyway, it was Hillary Clinton saying this is the speech she was going to give if she won the president of the United States. But she, <laughs> this idea of like overcoming obstacles, and certainly she has overcome many in order to get a lot of power. And she is. She's, pro she's one of the most powerful women on the earth if you exclude Oprah. Right? So... <clears throat> And so she, this idea of like overcoming all these difficulties, it takes a lot of courage. And there's also this idea today, uh, like it takes a lot of courage to be yourself, that no matter what anybody else says, like the feelings that are inside of me, I don't want to moderate them because of what other people are saying. And so it takes a certain amount of courage. So in some pay, people are going to say it takes this fortitude and this courage. And we see this a lot in a lot of different ways. And we see people getting praised for it. 
That's so courageous, you know? It's so wonderful. Even though oftentimes the very act of saying that courage seems to be it actually reverses courage. So we see people like, hopefully, you know, this does not become a popular thing on YouTube. I'm going to be like the least popular person on planet Earth. But like Simone Biles, you know, and God bless her. I used to dive in high school and I know what it's like to really be very nervous and to have it so that you're, you know, it, it affects you physiologically. But, you know, her courage to basically not courageously go forward, right? That's the effect sometimes of saying courage is the end of it, end all and be all, is that it twists you up so much that you end up being courageous to be cowardly, you know? It's courageous to be cowardly, which is, of course, the opposite of what courageous means. But if we put fortitude at the top, we can come to a place where we're seeking after not always the right things, right? But we're doing it in a, in a courageous way, and we might even accomplish a lot. Or it even can become self-contradictory, and we lose what it means to be courageous. But in, a, in the Christian life, it can mean that we say, like, whatever is hard, whatever is hard is what perfects it. So if I go and I join the most austere Franciscan community that sleeps on the floor and has hair shirts and whip themselves and they, you know, uh, don't, don't wear warm clothes in the winter and they do all these things because they're hard, then that is the perfection of Christianity. Okay? And so uh, Father Gary Lugaran said, well, clearly that's that's not the case. Right? We, we can see just by the fact of it that it, it doesn't necessarily lead you to being a good Christian, even though you might be doing hard things. However, it's very clear that in order to reach perfection and fulfillment, you have to do hard things. So it requires fortitude. Right? Being a soldier is not the end-all, be-all. However, there is something important about being a soldier for Christ. Last time I was here, as I said, my parishioners were receiving holy confirmation in which you become a soldier for Christ. That is important. But clearly it cannot be just fortitude. So then there's another stream from even ancient times, and we see it today as well, where it says, well, like, what it means to be truly fulfilled is that you have to have this fullness of Wisdom. And wisdom is really where it is. And so you had uh, the many ancient philosophers as well, and everyone from their time until now, saying, like, if we just know enough, right, knowledge becomes power, and if we have that power, well, then we can choose to do that which will make us most fulfilled. And so if we just build up all of the knowledge of things, then we will have that power. And so some people do that in a, in a scientific way, and we can look now, and even though it seems like we have more people killing themselves than ever before, more people making themselves completely miserable who have power possibly more than ever in human history, we have people saying, this is the greatest moment for humanity because we have all of this science and all of this wisdom, all of this knowledge. So clearly something is wrong there. It's certainly not leading us to the fulfillment of humanity. But we can even look at it in a Christian sense as well. Or let's just take it on a less of a knowledge way and a wisdom way and say, well, it means to be virtuous. And so we might look at someone who I have a great deal of respect for, uh, which is someone like, wow, I, it just went out of my mind just now. Maybe I'm not supposed to talk about this. Uh, the Canadian uh, psychiatrist, what is his name? Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson. Tremendous amount of respect for him, it's good. But he's, he's like, well, if we can understand ourselves enough, and then make courageous decisions in order to do the right thing, well, then we can have fulfillment in life. So maybe it's not just about having power, but having power to do the right things. And, and maybe that's not just external things, but maybe it's interior things in order to be a really good person and to live not just for ourselves, but to live for others. 
I think I heard a talk with him the other day. And he was saying like the most fulfilling thing that people find who, who get to the pinnacle of the career is assisting others to do well. Mentoring. You know that this is fulfillment. And in some way you say this is wisdom. In fact, he takes a lot of the wisdom of the ancient philosophers and he really expounds them uh, a lot. And, and his thing is kind of wisdom and understanding this ancient traditions that have come down and understanding them. However, the problem is, is that fulfillment still doesn't come. Our Lord Jesus Christ certainly is truth itself, and yet there's something more there, because there can be an overabundance of knowledge, and yet not perfection. There can be people who know all of the truths in the world, and all the truths about themselves even, and yet don't find full perfection. And certainly, we don't always see in them the image, right, that we see of perfection that we see in the holy face, right, as we do this devotion. And we're on day two of this wonderful novena where we reflect on he who is perfection, Christ Jesus. And so clearly, in these things, we have not only, oh, and then there's an idea of, of even Christian perfection. It's like, well, if you know everything, if you read all of Thomas Aquinas, if you read all of Father Gary Goulagrange even, if you read all of these spiritual books and all of the mystics of the church, so you can recite, um, you know, St. Hildegard von Bingen and, you know, all of these things. If you would know all of this, still, you can displease God. Still, you can live in a way that you find that the law that is within you of the, you know, sinful f- foams, that they, they still come out, that there's still, you're still unhappy with the things that you do, even though you have all of this wisdom. Well, that's not where their fulfillment is. And so Father Gary Lugarange comes around and shows, in a way, that from the ancient times and ones that... I mean, I think that these are really kind of like the two main streams where we see it in our society as well. These ideas of humanity where we say, well, like, well we can shape humanity into whatever it is. We just have enough, enough courage to go there. Or we can, you know, just, you have to choose and be courageous. Or you just have to have all the wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and then you'll be there. Right? If you just watch enough informational YouTube videos, then you'll have it. But clearly, this is not the way. And, and Fa- Father Gary Lagrange has an, a great chapter in which he talks about these three things. He makes a very convincing argument from the scriptures that indeed the fulfillment of human person is it's in charity. And that charity must govern all the other virtues. And that ultimately it requires fortitude and it requires wisdom, but they must be pointed towards charity as, uh, you know, coming from charity and moving towards it. And charity, of course, is that theological virtue which is infused into us from the moment of our baptism, which its object is God, that we love God. And it's subject to God. I mean, God gives to us the ability to love him. We love him with his own love, we might say. St. John of the Cross is this beautiful image of, you know, God, I want to warm you and give you this light which you placed within me. You know, these dark caves of my soul and this light and warmth that comes from you. May you bathe in the light and the warmth that you yourself put there. Charity, And that has to inform all the virtues. So not only do we have to choose to be courageous with fortitude, but it should be for the love of God. Everything that I do in order to be courageous and do something hard, it's not because it's hard or because to gain power or to even fulfill myself, but in order to please the Lord, in order to love Him. And to have wisdom is important to have knowledge is important but we must do so out of the love of god and so that means that we can have a vice called curiosity curiositas right where we seek after things that are not helpful for us in loving god 
or, or doing his holy will. Since love, St. Augustine says, is nothing other than a union of wills. To do and will what God loves, the good of the other. But for God and charity. So, now that I've said that, I, I recommend that you get this book and take a look at that wonderful chapter. Now I'm going to talk about the things that I really want to talk about, which is some of the core things that are in this book that I think are useful and in understanding the growth in charity. So if we have this idea of understanding what it is that is the fulfillment of human nature, then we can come to an understanding, and I don't think if, if you're reading the lives of the saints, I think many of you are, if you're reading great spiritual authors, you know, there's not enough time in this lifetime to read all of these spiritual things that are out there and are fine because there are great spiritual authors. You can be reading St. Francis de Sales' Treatise on the Love of God, you know, and God bless, uh, you know, all of these people who are writing all these books. And Matthew Kelly writes these books, and I know people who come back to the faith because they read Matthew Kelly books, but at the same time, like, if you're trying to go deeper, Matthew Kelly is supposed to bring you in so that you can then go deep. And don't waste your time reading all these books of people explaining to you other things, go deep. There's some times when it's very helpful where someone like Father Gary Lou Garange, who has a lot of expertise and knowledge, can guide us to understand how all of these great spiritual authors work together in a way that's very practical in our life. But I know many of you are reading, you know, things like St. Francis de Sales, St. Bonaventure, St. Thomas, you know, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, go straight to them. But it can be very helpful to get a book like this where all of those are going to come together and we're going to see, oh, wow, there's a pattern in how this feels and goes forward, and that can help me in order to make changes in my life so that everything is ordered towards charity. And how is it that it grows in my life? So we can read the... The mansions, right, the interior mansions of St. Teresa of Avila, and she gives a perspective of how is it that the soul grows in grace. But what's interesting is, is when you take her and you take the ascent of Mount Carmel and the dark night of the soul by St. John of the Cross, in which he does something similar but has a different schema, and then you take St. Thomas Aquinas, and then he has a schema of actually how the soul progresses, in fulfillment, in growing in charity. And when Father Gary Lugrange, who's an expert on all of them, puts them all together and says, like, and also the theologians of the last 500 years have shown that there's this, this progression, it, it can be very helpful for us as we also read those great spiritual authors. So I don't want to say, like, oh, find people that are going to synthesize it together, but of course find trusted sources like Father Gary Lugrange, and then also be reading those great texts. And so I want to give you a brief overview of that three ages of the interior life, of what it means to grow in charity and what that looks like. And you think this is helpful at all, buy this book. I wish I could get proceeds from it, but you know. So in the understanding of the uh, ascetical theology of the spiritual life of growth in charity through time, there is an almost general consensus among the great spiritual authors that there, there are three ages, right? And so uh, sometimes they're called the beginner stage, Probably didn't see this coming. Intermediate. <laughs> and the proficient. It's a big leap. Oh, wait. The perfect. Sorry. Perfect. 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 
complete, right? Or advanced. Well, sorry. Mixing them up, okay. Advanced. You who you were like, okay, you did surprise me, but now advanced, not surprising. Right? Or as St. John of the Cross will call it, uh, the beginner or the proficient and the perfect. Or as St. Thomas Aquinas will say, uh, it's kind of like an infant, an adolescent, and an adult. St. Thomas is very interested in talking about uh, the, the spiritual life as imaged by our corporal life. And it doesn't necessarily age the same way, right? You can have a 98-year-old who's a spiritual infant, and you can have a great saint like St. Francisco Marto, who's clearly an, an adult, right, uh, when he uh, passed away, him and St. Jacinta, right? I think she was 10 or 11 years old when she died. Or someone like the little uh, Nanalina, right, of holy... No. I'm confusing them. Little Nelina, right, uh, who, who died. I think she was like six or seven years old when she died. But clearly, uh, she was perfect, living in what traditionally is called the unitive way. So then this, you may have heard this before, too. So then it would be the purgative way, the illuminative way. The unitive way. And this is important. It's important to understand that what this means is, is that there, there are stages in our spiritual life, and there's room probably for you to grow. And if we can understand what this life is and how it is characterized and how to move from one to the other, then you in your spiritual life can at least have some measure of diagnosis of where you're at and what is necessary for you to grow in charity. You know? And so this, one of the great things about this book is not only does he give these characteristics, which I'm going to uh, enumerate for you, but then he has a whole section here, which we do not have time for, in which he's going to talk about uh, how do we not only move from one to another, but what is it that kind of prevents us from moving one to another? Or how is it that sometimes souls, which are not generous enough, or start out generous and then pull back and might fall back, what are things that hold us back? So let me just read you a couple of these titles uh, as a enticement for you to really buy this book and, and dig into it. So after he speaks, begins to talk about the spiritual age of beginners, which we are going to talk about in just a minute, he then talks about uh, means by which uh, we advance, sins to be avoided in order to make sure that you continue to progress, and then he goes into things like the predominant fault. So in the scientific study, which is what he is explaining for us here and using, According to the method of St. Thomas Aquinas, the scientific study of the spiritual life shows us that pretty much everyone has a predominant fault, and you can discern what that is and ask God to help you. The Holy Spirit wants to help you. So that, knowing what that is, you can mortify that fault and that it assists you greatly in growing in virtue and perfecting charity. And then he goes over... Well, how do you deal with your different passions? Everybody has different passions that are uh, more predominant in their life. Some of us struggle, right, with, uh, uh, well, different, different ones. I think we can all understand that. And then he speaks about how to work on certain faults that we have. He talks about the active purification of the will. How do we go about doing that? And then he goes through, well, how do we heal pride if that's your predominant fault? The healing of spiritual sloth or asadia, right? The use of sacramental confession for such, assistance at Mass, source of sanctification, how Holy Communion helps us, prayer petition, liturgical prayer, how do these all fit in in growth 
in virtue, not just sort of doing these things because you heard a homily, you know that they're good, or you have a desire for them, and so you do them, but how do you fit them in in a way that's wise while courageously doing so instead of just sort of moving forward in a haphazard way? But let me give you some... Since we're, you know, limited in the amount of time that we have, like I said, I'm going to give you some characteristics of these three stages in order for you to be like, hopefully that's helpful in some way and be able to say like, oh, maybe that's where I'm at or that's something I have looked forward to or something that I want to know more about. Oh yeah, he also has a, a great part at the end of the first volume on retarded souls which the 12-year-old inside of me is excited to read, was excited to read. But it's also just about the things that we do that prevent us from moving forward and that might make it so that uh, we can't move forward and we don't know why we're not growing in virtue. Right? We're seeming to do all the right things, and yet why is it uh, that I'm not growing in charity? Or if I'm doing so, it's, it's very low. Okay. I'm going to write out a... Uh, so now that you have some of this nomenclature here, for beginner, which usually is called the purgative way, because there's a very active part of our will, this is important. And if you're reading the great spiritual classics, then you've probably heard this. The purgative way. That's the beginner. That's when we begin in the life of grace, and we see... I need to change my life. I, I want to live in a state of grace. Sometimes I fall into mortal sin, but I want to strive in order to not fall into mortal sin. I'm using the means that God gives to me. I'm mortifying those desires I have that I know pull me into sin. I'm praying daily. I'm going to Mass on Sundays and trying to do it even more. Receiving Holy Communion as much as I can. Going to sacramental confession on a regular basis. And then especially if I fall into mortal sin, to make sure that I have active charity in my life, that it is the thing that can govern everything. Because when we mortally sin, of course, we lose charity in our souls. And so growth in charity is not possible if you don't have active, live charity in your life. So you need to be in a state of grace as much as possible, right? In order to grow in charity. And so that's the purgative way, right? I'm saying this because I'm going to keep beginner, intermediate, and advanced up here, but I want you to really remember purgative way because that is the very traditional way of talking about it. And then the illuminative way is kind of, it's the cusp of living uh, the mystical life, deeply rooted in God. It means that the virtues in my life, faith, hope, charity, right? Uh, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance, that the, the activity of those are growing in us and generally shape what we do in our life. So most of the choices that I make in my life are not between should I sin or should I not sin, but what are the best things in life, right? Sorry, I didn't mean to say it like that. That sounded like I was quoting Conan the Barbarian. But, uh, you know, like, wh how do I choose between the things that are good in my life that are both good? You know, how do I discern God's will that I am being more and more open, especially not only to those infused virtues in my life because I have active faith, hope, and charity, but also uh, in the purgative way where we have to be open to the promptings of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, speaking of confirmation, but also in the illuminative way, they begin to be more active in our life. So we're discerning more God's will, not simply in the great things in our life, but in everything that we do. We're led by those seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, right, that are enumerated in, uh, I want to say, the 11th chapter of Isaiah. So, <clears throat> knowledge, wisdom, fortitude, understanding, counsel, right? fear of the Lord, piety. So those things become more active in our life, and so we're being led more and more by the Spirit of God because we have worked hard in order to remove vice from our life, sin, and so the virtues are flowering, 
and that flowering is especially a, uh, a deeper union with the will of God and so an awareness of that working more in our life. And it's the cusp of living the unitive way, which is where our wills are completely united with God. And charity begins to be perfect in us, which means charity is that act by which we obtain God. <laughs> Faith, we know the things that God has given to us, right? We can neither deceive nor be deceived. Hope is where that virtue by which we uh, live in a, in a great practical trust of God because we know that he's helping us and that he has created a place for us in heaven and that he's forgiving our sins, right? But it is charity by which we possess God. We love him because he is all good and he resides in us that we become temples uh, of the Holy Spirit and of course the Holy Trinity. And that when that becomes perfection in this life, not its full perfection, which is even a greater flowering of it in heaven, but we call that the unitive way when it's here on earth. Okay, now I'm going to delete these. I mean, the uh, erase those things below. Purgative, illuminative, unitive. I'm just going to keep beginner, intermediate, advanced. And then I'm going to write some things that Father Gargoul Lagrange puts down as characteristic of those because I think it's going to be helpful for us to be able to identify with ourselves. And then I'll talk a little bit about the passive purifications, which are kind of where uh, the in-between. How do, what are the jumps between beginner, intermediate, and advanced, and purgative, illuminative, and unitive? Because it's helpful for us to know that, and it'll use some language that we might be familiar with. Uh, yeah. So in here we have uh, there, there are certain things that characterize each one of these according to the great spiritual authors and, of course, as we reflect on uh, what we see in our Lord and in the lives of the saints. Beginners have what they call the first degree of charity. So we uh, obtain God, but there's a, a certain imperfection about it uh, that we do things out of love for God, but it's also admixed with love of self. And it's important to remember that if we don't have the supernatural uh, virtue of charity in our life, then we cannot do things out of love for God. Anything that you do, if you are in a state of mortal sin and you think you're doing it for God, you're really doing it for yourself. You're thinking like, boy, it would be really great if I do something for God because I want to feel better or I, you know, I want to do this or I want God to favor me or maybe like I want to go to heaven or whatever, even though I know I'm in a state of mortal sin. So it's extremely important to be in a state of grace. And that imperfect first measure of charity means it's admixed with this love of self. And so as a result, it, there's not a full flowering of the virtues. However, what we see is a growth in these virtues and they become uh, more pro predominant in our life or more characteristic in our faith life and how we seek God and seek others. So I'm going to put the first degree of charity. First degree of charity. And that is characterized especially by a certain amount of meekness. Meekness begins to grow. A, a patience, where maybe there wasn't patience before. And we see this a lot with people who have a great conversion to the faith, right? They begin to go to confession, really the basis, begin to go to Holy Mass, and suddenly there's a great patience. That the, the interior life becomes one where there's not just a conversation with yourself, because we all have a conversation with ourselves about what we're doing. You know, oh, you know, I, I, I need to grind the coffee for coffee tomorrow morning, right? And then I, don't forget to do that. Oh, yes, I left my keys. You know, that's an internal monologue that we have. But when the spiritual life begins to grow, of course, we all know, that begins to move. And it begins to move to be like, oh, Lord, so it's addressed to the Lord. There's a certain amount uh, that it goes to the Lord. And 
So the interior life goes, and there's a desire to be with the Lord. And interesting, what comes out of that is this, this charity, patience, and a certain amount of meekness. And it's not just about yourself all the time. So there's a certain amount of patience that comes about, and chastity. And remember, this is the purgative way, which means that you're... Oh, Father mentioned this in his homily today. You're working to purify yourself, and it's very active. Your will makes an effort to change things. And so there becomes a preoccupation with having chastity where maybe there wasn't one before, or to really seeking to to change that, to have more chastity and a humility where there wasn't some before. Some form of interior and exterior mortification. So mortification, both interior and exterior. Mortification. Is desire. You desire to not always do your own will, but to have God's will be done. So you begin to do things like go to Mass, pray every day. Be disciplined about that, or at least desire to be disciplined, make plans for it, make small steps moving towards that, and these things grow. Vocal prayer characterizes this time. That means using words to pray, that we're praying the Angelus, that we're praying the Rosary, we're going and uh, we're learning the words of the Mass, offering them to Him. These are characteristic, right? Maybe a, uh, if moments where there is not vocal prayer, there might be a confusion. Like, oh, I wanted to pray, but instead I sat in front of the Blessed Sacrament, I didn't have anything to say, and I, but I wanted to pray, and Lord, I'm trying to pray, but I'm not, right? And so there's a, a not understanding uh, of what it means to not pray if there isn't a vocalization or at words involved. And meditation at that time. But there can be meditation. But that meditation tends to be discursive. In other words, you think about God. You think about what that means. You read something and then you're like, wow, what would it be like? You read something from the gospel. What would it be like to be with our Lord? Maybe you're doing Ignatian meditation, which would be, I I put myself, imaginative prayer, right? Orthodox are big into that. No, they think it's horrible. Anyway, uh, it's discursive, though. You're thinking about the things of God, or you're thinking about the good things, or you're thinking about, and, and there's a lot of content and thought about it. But there's a movement, okay? It's moving towards simpler prayer. So vocal prayer and discursive prayer, thinking of a lot of things, that's very complicated. In fact, you can think about very complicated things and you feel like, I'm coming to really amazing conclusions. You know, you go to a homily. I don't know if you've experienced this. I experienced this. That I go and I sometimes hear homilies and I'm like, wow, that was a beautiful thought. Like, that's amazing. I want to think about that all the time. And um, it it makes me think of something like, uh, I remember I heard in a homily once, and I've read it since, of St. Teresa of Avila, and she says, like, when you're praying, if you're having trouble praying, just think about who you're praying to. Like, wow, like, yeah, I'm praying to Jesus. So sometimes I'm praying, and I'm focused on the words, and then I forget that I'm praying to the Lord, you know? And so just bring that to mind. That's something that's very discursive, uh, that thought and that line from St. Teresa. But then I also, there are also homilies where sometimes a priest says things and it's something that I already know, but it cuts me so deeply, right, that I'm just like, oh, it's not that the content is different. It's just that there's a certain power there, and, and, it, and it cuts me, and I'm like, it gives me the power or the strength sometimes to change my life. It's a certain grace. It's an actual grace that comes from it, right? I mean, there's, there's the difference in, in how that comes about, right? And uh, maybe there could be something about that, too, is there's a movement from not just those thoughts, but even to something deeper or even like a being with God, a movement towards something that's simple. So if I already know that thought and it just cuts me deeper, there's something simple about it and yet 
powerful there. That's how I think of it anyway. Father Gary Lagrange does not say that, so do not blame him for my heretical thought that probably just went on there. But there's a simplicity. It's less thought and discursive and, you know, oh, this is an amazing thought and more simple being with the Lord, acts of love to him, right? St. Alphonsus Liguri is always saying all these amazing things and then he says, now make acts of love towards God, right? Tell him that you love him. And so there's a simplicity. It's becoming simpler. Uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit at this point. Gift. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are mostly latent. So if you're in this beginner stage or the purgative stage, you usually don't notice very much wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel. You know, maybe you pray a lot for God's will, but you don't always feel like there's an answer. And those things. Uh, they come out sometimes, takes a lot of prayer and work, but the soul is especially unconscious, okay? All right, it's, it's, it's especially unconscious of the work of the Holy Spirit, but it's very conscious of our own activity. All right. Affective prayer is very important, which becomes more and more simple. Then something happens. A crisis. So in this first stage, the purgative way, working very hard, and all of these things become more and more. And vocal prayer moves towards the simple. Meekness. Patience, chastity, humility, these become more and more regular in life. We have a much more disciplined prayer time. It's much easier to give yourself. I shouldn't say easier. It's much more of a habit to give yourself fully to God. And maybe you're starting to notice a little bit more the gifts of the Holy Spirit working in you and being led by God. Maybe a certain peace about choosing things and moving forward as you live a life of grace. You're not falling into mortal sin all the time. And then everything goes wrong. There's a crisis. And St. John of the Cross calls this the dark night of the senses. It's like something goes badly, people start to treat you poorly, you lose your job, right? Or, or you, you can't do things right anymore, like things that you were very good at, suddenly you're not recognized as doing well at, or you yourself think you're just like a failure, there's a huge failure in your life, and uh, maybe it becomes very hard for you to keep your schedule of prayer and also keep up the rest of life. And when a soul is generous and continues to work on the spiritual life and to live charity, live in a state of grace, to continue all of these practices, to take the courageous step to say, like, Lord, even though everything is going badly and it seems like you yourself are, like, cursing me, how could this be going around? The generous soul continues. And we could say that I was on retreat a couple weeks ago. At Mount Angel, and I talked to a monk there when I went to confession, and he said a line. Let's see if I can remember it. He said, It's God, it's the God wanting you to be attached to the God who gives consolations, not the consolations given by God, right? So God is drawing at you in this crisis and seeming failure to be generous with him and say like, Lord, it doesn't seem like I'm getting what I thought was my part of the bargain because I was growing in chastity, I was growing in meekness, I was growing in humility, I was praying more, I'm doing all these good things and yet everything is going badly now for me, right? I'm being slandered by this priest or like thrown out. And oftentimes it does have something to do with the spiritual consolations that we get that they stop coming. So maybe like prayer is not giving me the peace that I used to have that made it, you know, so that I could get through the day. Or the people that I associate my uh, prayer life with reject me. Or something terrible happens. 
Of course, priests would never do anything terrible, or spiritual fathers, or bishops, or uh, anyone else in the hierarchy would never do anything that would make us feel like, you know, maybe our spiritual life is, is not doing what it should be doing, or the church is not giving us what we should give, right? We experience that all the time. And so that, that crisis, though, becomes very personal, and God invites us to, to go through that. And say, like, Lord, I'm going to stick with you, even though it seems like this is not such a good deal anymore. And the generous soul that does not turn back, that doesn't say, like, you know what? This isn't working. I'm going to go back to those sinful pleasures, or I'm going to just taste a little bit the sinful pleasures that I've worked so hard in order not to get, because clearly this is not working out very well. You know, I've been working really hard on chastity, but you know, I'm just going to just going to peruse, you know, things really quickly online and see what's going on with these old things that I did or this I'm going to call that person that I know I shouldn't or or maybe, you know, I'm going to act in a certain way that I used to act around people that I work really hard not to do. Whatever it may be, it was a turning back. Of, I'm not going to pray all the time, you know, Exodus 90 is over. I'm going to stop these mortifications that I know are helpful to me in order to grow in holiness. Whatever it is, there's a, there can be a turning back, and that's where you become a retarded soul. We don't want that. You don't want to be retarded. You don't want to turn back because it can actually become even more difficult to overcome and move on to the next stage of the spiritual life if you turn back at that point. You want to be generous and give yourself. That doesn't mean that if you fall that there's no going back. There's always going back. Our Lord always gives us another opportunity, right? There's a wonderful, he's not a saint, but he's a venerable, I think, or no, he might just be a servant of God. Anyway, he's either a servant of God or a venerable. He's the founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. Father Timothy Gallagher is a priest of them. They focus only on giving the spiritual exercises. And Father, Father, Father Timothy Gallagher is like the English-speaking expert on St. Ignatius' spiritual exercises. And he also wrote a great book and has a podcast series on that book about their founder. I think he's venerable. Pino, uh, Pio Bruno Lanteri. And he had a phrase that was like his, his catchphrase, Nunc chepi, now I begin. Even if I fall, I begin again now. Right? There's always an opportunity to begin again. Our Lord is always there. We go to Holy Confession if we need to. We begin again. Right? But even uh, better to progress in the spiritual life is to be generous to the Lord and to, to go through, to go all the way with Cal uh, Calvary with him. Right? And the best, we know that the best way to do that, of course, is to consecrate yourself to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And we know that from the Holy Scriptures, because who was there at the foot of the cross? None of the other apostles, right? We can always take the way of St. Peter and be reconciled to the Lord better, but much better to be dragged by Our Lady like St. John was to the foot of the cross, right? And to make it through this crisis, the dark night of the soul. And for those who persevere through that, prayer becomes more simple, Right? And virtues begin to sprout, which the person themselves may not be able to notice as much. The second degree of charity. A greater love for God, a greater ease and desire to do all things for Him. And especially obedience. Obedience begins uh, to be something that's really... Uh, much more characteristic of the life. A more profound, more profound humility. And the spirits of the council. The councils, by the councils I mean poverty, chastity, and obedience. That there's a great desire for that and that begins to uh, characterize your life more and more. And they become solid virtues. Whereas in the purgative way, the meekness, patience, chastity, humility, which characterize that, and all the other virtues, of course, are growing under the guidance of charity. They're weak, right? 
And so we can lose them easily. But these ones are firmly planted. Obedience, more profound humility, poverty, chastity, obedience. These become so characteristic of our life that it's like the norm. Like it would take effort to choose not to live them. That doesn't mean that they're easy to live. You have to choose them, but you have to make a deliberate choice. Whereas sometimes when the virtues are initial in the purgative way, right? It takes a lot of effort to just stay in the groove of them, even though you might have a habit of doing it. You know, it's like you pray every day for three months and then you go on vacation and you get back from vacation and then you're like, man, I didn't pray for five days, right? Whereas if you're in the illuminative way, it would be, I mean, it's just you wake up in the morning and you're praying on vacation. Like things change and then those things continue. Obedience becomes more characteristics. Good. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. Come out. They were there before, and sometimes they were there. But you begin to be more and more to be led by the Holy Spirit. And there, there's an effect on the virtues. They become more solid. But also there, there's a sense of, uh, you know, the, the Lord working on you, especially the gifts of fear of the Lord, which especially works with temperance, so it's for the lower part, so in other words, you start to have more and more victory in Christ, I guess you could say, or the virtues are more and more instantiated in your lower uh, faculties. Knowledge and piety, these are the, the gifts that work on the lower parts of our um, of our nature the most. They give us courage. Or, or they, anyway, yes. And the soul becomes more docile to these gifts. So they, they become more noticeable. And they profit. You profit more from inspirations and interior illuminations during prayer and other times as well. And infused prayer becomes more common. So prayer that's not vocal, vocal prayer doesn't go away. I just want to make sure that you're aware of this. <laughs> vocal prayer doesn't go away. Like you don't stop praying the rosary so that you can just, you know, levitate in your apartment by yourself or something like that. But you're still by the rosary, but you, there's a depth to it. And there's a simplicity. There's a desire to be with the Lord and maybe more characterized by not simply the sometimes gift that the Lord gives of a simplicity of prayer, but this, there's a common just uniting of the heart, of the raising of the heart to God. And there's not always words there. There's a being with the Lord. And the Lord being with us. As that the curie of ours, St. John Marie Vianney, apparently at one point, there was a peasant who would come to church all the time, and just sit in the pew. And allegedly he, he went to that peasant and he said like, what do you do in the church? And he said, I look at God and God looks at me. Right? There's this simplicity of being with the Lord. And that characterizes the prayer. Simplicity. Yet all those devotions and vocal prayers don't necessarily go away. And say, I do want to also point out that St. Teresa of Avila, when she talks about the mansions, and then I want to say in her autobiography somewhere, although someone can correct me that it's somewhere else, she does mention that she knows nuns who are like in the highest mansion and they get there by basically like praying the rosary all the time. They're praying vocal prayers all the time. So even though there's a great simplicity and union of God and yet that vocal prayer is one. But generally, what we see is a simplicity of prayer. And this is what we would usually call like really good Catholics. We'd be like, like this person is a, you know, they're a prayer warrior and they're always there at, at Mass and they're like full of virtue and goodness and they love God and they love their neighbor out of love for God and they're just like really, really good. And I think a lot of us are usually tempted to be like, that person's a saint, you know? But they're just in the illuminative way. Then, for those who persevere in that and are very generous with the Lord and very disciplined in their prayer and their works of 
charity, of their mortifying, uh, their parts of their uh, lower senses, as well as, of course, their intellect and will, not choosing themselves, but choosing God. Then they come to another crisis. And that crisis... Number two, between the intermittent and the advanced. And St. John of the Cross, you've probably heard of this before. He has a book. It's called that, The Dark Night of the Soul. And the dark night of the soul is where, maybe you've heard of this of Mother Teresa or other saints who have experienced this. I'm pretty sure it's what St. Paul of the Cross calls uh, a pure faith. But it's where they feel not just like they are doing everything wrong and the world is against them and like God's cursed them, but they feel abandoned by God and they feel no spiritual consolation. In fact, they can feel like God hates them or that God doesn't exist. That's what Mother Teresa experienced for 60 years, they say, that, that it felt like God didn't exist. And yet miracles happened around her, all of these things, that God is clearly with her. People who feel the way that she described feeling, like don't get out of bed in the morning. You know, she slept like four hours a day, did like two holy hours, and like picked people up off the street. Amazing. And that's the action of God. That's the Holy Spirit. In fact, someone said, like, you're an amazing community organizer. <laughs> and they said, like, how do you do that? Like, how did you learn how to do that? And she just said, I'm a pencil in the hand of God, right? And that's because in this, what we see is, is that for those generous souls that persevere in this, where they feel like I'm completely abandoned by God, and yet desire more than anything to love and please them, even if their soul is damned, right, or God doesn't exist, how can those things go together? only by grace, you start to see eminent and heroic virtues. The third degree of charity, a perfect love of God, that all things are done out of a perfect love for God with a complete despising of the self. When I say despising, I don't mean like, I hate me, I'm bad, but like a forgetfulness, a total forgetfulness of self, right? Third degree. Charity and the heroic virtues right and when we say heroic virtues we mean like when we see that we're like whoa like that is totally out of the bounds of what you normally see perfect humility i was talking to brother of agrius who of agrius who i uh brought down from the monastery in sprague to visit his his family down here uh, the the haydens and I was talking to him about possibly the first time we were around each other. I don't think I met him, but he was in Norcha at the time. And uh, they, uh, I went and I visited Norcha for a couple days, prayed in the, the crypt before the, uh, it was totally destroyed by the terrible earthquake they had there. And I said, it, it struck me that when I went there, they were doing the table reading of St. Bonaventure's Life of St. Francis of Assisi. And uh, they told the story of St. Francis, or they were reading the life where St. Francis went to go to Monte Gargano. And it, I remember this because I had just been to Monte Gargano and consecrated myself to St. Michael there. This is the cave of St. Michael where St. Michael appeared, I believe, in the 5th century. And St. Francis of Assisi decided towards the end of his life, when he had the stigmata, he couldn't walk anymore because it was so painful. He actually wore shoes at that point, I guess, and uh, rode on a donkey because um, that's what our Lord did. If he's going to ride on an animal, he's going to do what our Lord did, very uncomfortable and hard. And he uh, was on his way from Assisi, I guess, to Monte Gargano. And uh, he had a great deal of holiness. And people recognize that. He had this whole retinue of all the third order brothers and all that or not third order but whatever they are the future franciscans and they were with him and they were going through a field and there was a farmer there and the farmer said like oh you're the great francis you know you're but just wait you're gonna do one little thing and all these people that love you all these things are all going to turn against you and you're going to lose it all and i remember sitting there and i was like this is where St. Francis says something so humble and amazing that the, this farmer, you know, is, is shamed and converted. But it, and so, indeed, 
St. Francis stops his donkey. It's not a donkey. Yeah, it's a donkey. And then he turns to the man, gets off the donkey, hobbles over to him, because he's in so much pain, you know, from the stigmata, kneels down and kisses the man's feet and says, thank you. You're absolutely right. You're like a messenger from God. And then he gets up and he gets back on his donkey. And then he goes to Monte Gargano. And when he gets there, they're about to go inside of the sanctuary of St. Michael. And he says, you know what? I'm not worthy to even go inside of the sanctuary. And he turns around and goes back to, uh, <laughs> uh, to a CC. Amazing story. But like that is heroic virtue. Heroic virtue of humility, where he doesn't have like this pissy thing where he wins. He's like, no, you're absolutely right. You know? And that farmer must have been like, oh yeah, I mean, I guess I was right. <laughs> you know? I mean, I don't think he went away like, oh my, oh, I'm so, I'm not humble enough, you know? I think he was like, wow, I, even St. Francis agreed with me. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, it's humbling, I guess, but also it's beautiful. That is heroic humility, right? And we see that. A great spirit of faith, right? That overcomes all things. Abandonment to divine providence. Uh, great faith. Total abandonment, we could say. If you guys have seen that beautiful novena from Father Don Delindo, that uh, uh, Nepalese priest, very beautiful. Um, I think Padre Pio actually mentioned it once. I mean, they were like on opposite sides of Italy. I don't think they ever met. But he talked about how, how beautiful the soul of Don Delindo was. It, it's this uh, novena of abandonment. And of course, that, that amazing spiritual classic by Father um, Jean-Pierre de Cassade. Total abandonment. You see that is completely characteristic of the life of those who are living in the unitive way. Like, just whatever the will of God is. Total abandonment to it, no matter how horrible it seems like it's going to be. And it almost, and this is, this is so key, in case you ever thought you were in the unitive way, this is almost a guarantee to tell you that you're not in it. An almost unalterable Patience. I was just talking to Brother Evagrius just before uh, we came over here, actually, and, and his brother came to get him. And uh, I was, I was telling him we were talking, uh, we were talking about Rome, and we were talking about the Church of. Uh, I believe it's called Sacra Cora and Sofragenza. It's, I, I, I think I was told it's the only neo-Gothic church in Rome. And that's impressive because there's something like 250 churches in Rome. I mean, it's amazing. And, uh, and there, there's this purgatory museum there. Maybe you've heard of it. Well, one of them, I believe it's the handprint on a prayer book, but I might be wrong. Uh, there are a bunch of different ones. And I think it's from the sister of St. Aloysius Gonzaga. St. Aloysius Gonzaga is like amazing saint of purity. If you haven't read the life of St. Aloysius Gonzaga, you should read it and then pray very much for my uh, alma mater, please, although she's not so alma. Uh, and that is uh, Gonzaga University, uh, filthy den of iniquity. Anyway, regardless, uh, St. Aloysius Gonzaga was very pure and holy, amazing. One of the great, great saints, certainly one of the most amazing Jesuit saints. And um, it, but she, he had a sister, apparently the whole family was quite holy, and she was in a convent, and she died, and everybody was like, she's like a saint, it's amazing, uh, you know, I mean, like, they prayed a bit for her, and then they were like, I mean, she's basically a saint, it's just based a matter of time, uh, you know, before this holiness comes about, and uh, one of the sisters she appeared to one of the sisters in the convent and said, like, you need to say masses for my soul. Like, I'm in purgatory. And the sister was basically like, is this real? Like, is this Satan? Like, are you real? Uh, no one's going to believe me that you need masses said for your soul. Why do you need masses said for your soul? 
And she said, well, at the end of my life, I had a few moments where I was impatient with God during my sickness. <laughs> I, anyway, that's like the assurance that I'm going to spend like a thousand years in purgatory. So, uh, yeah, so, and, and then in order to show, like, and I will show you, so she like burned her handprint into a prayer book or pillow or something like that. Anyway, uh, amazing. The Sister of St. Alice and Gonzaga uh, had some slight moments of impatience with God. So not an almost unalterable patience that we see in the unitive way. And then the higher gifts manifest themselves more notably. So the gifts of the Spirit, the highest ones, uh, and they frequently... So knowledge, wisdom, understanding, counsel, like God himself counseling on you what to do, right? And this is like Our Lady. This is why St. Maximilian Kolbe is famous for saying that Our Lady is like the quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit, meaning that whatever Mary, our Blessed Mother, did, right, it was an action of the Holy Spirit. She was so perfectly docile to the Holy Spirit that she only did what the Holy Spirit uh, did. So any act of Our Lady is, a, is an act of the Holy Spirit, right? Her spouse. And this is like the unitive way. Our Lady is the model here. And that is where the gifts of the Holy Spirit are so pronounced, which are only regulated by God's action, not our ability. Like you see those coming out. And that's where we see, of course, great things in the lives of saints, miracles, things outside of nature, great passivity to God's will. But it doesn't exclude the, the activity of the virtues. That doesn't mean that the person is not still actively choosing difficult, in difficult circumstances to be virtuous. They are. The gifts. They're strong. We'll say that. Strongly manifesting themselves. Concomitant trials. I'll just read this to you. Concomitant trials in which are manifested the gifts of fortitude and counsels, especially while the gifts of understanding are very clear. Entrance into the perfect unitive way. So this is key, is that all of the spiritual authors, and Father points out, only the most generous souls. It requires extreme generosity and trust in God. There is zero turning back at this point to, to get delights in sin or, or to move back. That there's, there's no looking back. As our Lord says, like anyone who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of me. And to move into the illuminative way, we could say in a way, but especially the unitive way, is it takes a great amount of courage. And St. Teresa of Avila, if you've read this in the interior mansions, you know she talks about like it takes so much courage to continue in those later mansions. This is key. So be generous and be courageous in trusting God. I was just listening to, I think it was the Resistance podcast. Anyway, something the other day, I think, I don't know, I've been driving a lot lately, so I'm starting to forget which, what came from where. But they talked about like a saint, and apparently someone, I, I think he was a founder of an order or something, and they said like, if he had a fault, it was that he had too much faith, <laughs> you know? And I think when people say that kind of thing, that, that is indicative of that kind of generosity and not turning back in courageousness, you know? A great faith. Anyway, so I wanted to lay these out in order to say, uh, there, there's a whole lot more to be said about it and do it, but I, I've talked for a really, really long time. And so I'm just gonna say, these things hopefully are laid out in order for you to say like, wow, there's so much more for me to do. And People are going to like ask me, like, how do I know what stage I'm in? Well, get a spiritual director. <laughs> but also read this book, The Three Ages of the Interior Life. You're going to find it very helpful. So that no matter what stage you're in, you can progress, and especially in understanding, like, 
how is mortification exterior or interior going to help me? How do I figure out what my predominant fault is? How do I ask God for that? How do I get help in order to do that? How do I then, once I've found my predominant fault, make sure that I'm doing the things that I need to do in order to make sure that that fault is less and less in my life through my active work and also through allowing the Holy Spirit to work in me? Can't recommend this enough. It is the fulfillment of all desire, right? It is found not in these uh, natural way of looking at things or, uh, you know, it's not just about all of these ideologies, which of course all of us here know, that are in the world today. They all miss the mark. And one of the ways that we can know that they miss the mark is because we can scientifically, I mean, in the old sense of the term, not in the scientist, you know, <clears throat> scientific, way of looking at the world but there, there's a certain science of looking at how the soul progresses and we see it in the saints of true fulfillment of human nature right human nature is not like undetermined and if we just rush into the world and you know our thesis of what it is will hit the antithesis and there'll be the, this you know grand synthesis out of it and we'll come into this brave new world where we're you know uh, what nobody could have imagined of human nature will suddenly come about and like there will be millions different ge uh, genders and all sorts of transhumanism things and we'll have green skin and we'll fly and you know have feathers if we want and all of these things they're all ridiculous we know that they're ridiculous and we know that they lead to despair and unhappiness that is so clear by looking around and yet what we also know and what we look so little at is when we read the lives of the saints and our Lord, and we see these, we can actually see the real progression and scientifically study the progression of the human person to true fulfillment. Yet we know so little about it today. Isn't that interesting? It's like someone's trying to keep it down. It's like there's this grand conspiracy by some great intellect to keep us from knowing this stuff. And and acting on it and being able to move forward in it. Which, of course, there is. That's why we need to have a great devotion to St. Michael, of course, and, and continue to, to ask. Uh, it is a spiritual battle. It takes fortitude. It takes wisdom. It takes generosity of spirit. It takes a great humility of asking for the help of the saints, of mortifying our senses. But all of them must be governed with this overall arching desire to love God above all things. And to stay in an active, in a state of grace. So that we know that it is that supernatural act of charity, of love for God that is guiding and shaping all of those virtues.